All right, hi everybody. Uh, this is my first conference presentation since the pandemic. I've been teaching the whole time, but it's kind of exciting to be back. So thank you for re-inviting me um, and coming here today. Um, so just a little bit about me, and by the way, that's my new digital uh, QR code business card. Um, I have it at the end too. Um, I've been uh, amazingly a professor for 10 years at Newhouse. I just kind of realized that this week. Um, and, but before that, I did a lot of things. Uh, it, some places that may be familiar to you, uh, that you've maybe worked at, I was at the Washington Post, Gary was there as well, worked at AOL on pro different digital products. The Bakersfield Californian was actually when I first started getting into what we now call the metaverse. Um, I was a Night News Challenge winner at startups and also worked on Harvest of Change, which uh, was what uh, uh, Ray Soto really made happen. Um, I kind of got it started, but um, that really was the project that turned a game designer into a journalist who's now a game designer who is still a journalist. So, <laughs> uh, And I have a book coming out soon, so I have to be that person now who says, and my book. Uh, but uh, this is my book. It's called Experimenting with Emerging Media Platforms. Uh, hopefully it comes out next year if anyone's interested in just reviewing it. There's a lot of stuff that I talk about that's in there, including how-to uh, type stuff that relates directly to the metaverse. Um, so where does this whole idea of the metaverse come from? Well, the term itself was actually uh, created by this guy, Neil Stevenson. Anybody here read this book or familiar with it? Okay, so a lot of people who have been doing things in VR or AR, XR, or whatever you want to call it, uh, remember this, uh, in, probably read it back in the 90s. Um, and I like to bring it up for two reasons. One, it was super dystopian. It was like, after you read that book, you didn't think, wow, I really want a world like that, right? But like most dystopia, it had really good warnings that I think make it worth maybe rereading so that that future does not happen. Um, but it also uh, kind of woke people up to this idea that, oh, there could be another uh, layer to our life that exists in some kind of digital form, the idea of avatars and things like that. It was uh, really uh, um, Neil Stevenson who created that, and he actually coined the word metaverse, <coughs> which uh, Mark Zuckerberg didn't even bring up when he renamed his company Meta. Um, so you look at, you know, 1992, does this look familiar to anybody? <laughs> I'm just curious, looking to, at the like, gray hairs out here. Okay, so this was the, my first experience with anything remotely metaverse E, and it was called The Palace. Um, so it was two years after Snow Crash came out. Um, I remember I was working at the Washington Post, WashingtonPost.com, and a number of us had kind of come across this, and it was basically a visual chat room. And I mean, it's so old now, it was so ugly that you can't even see, like, read everything on there. I got this off Wikipedia. But basically, you have people with these really, you know, it's like, like simple avatars, and, you know, Mr. Bunny ears there. Uh, uh, you know, people kind of talking, and, and you had this idea of shared reality. Even though it was 2D, it was very bitmappy. Um, but what was interesting about it is if you look back, they were doing all the things that we start talking about what the metaverse is, that everyone's saying, oh, and this is going to happen one day. Well, it actually already has happened. So they had avatars, they called them dolls, which I thought was kind of funny, I didn't even know that at the time. Uh, virtual clothing uh, that you could kind of buy and sell called props. Uh, noticed that it was produced by Time Warner, so, you know, a media slash news company. Um, and brands were doing things in the space. So there was a South Park uh, kind of room in the palace. There were musicians, Korn. I had no idea that Korn had done, like, a palace, a metaverse room. Uh, the Sci-Fi Channel had a little area. And so even with, like, low fidelity, this idea of being uh, virtually present with people and having persistence, too, like if you went from one room to another, you left something, one of your objects, it would still be there when you went back and someone else could pick it up and take it with them. Uh, so these concepts are, are, are hardly new. Um, this is uh, just sort of an example of then by 2006, you're looking another, you know, like a decade later, Second Life, which I'm sure many people have at least heard of. Um, <coughs> this is uh, showing what uh, uh, NOAA, the North, uh, North Atlantic o Oceanic Administration, um, <coughs> oh, I left that an A. Uh, they created an island, so you can see the island right here, and it was basically a really experiential way for people to come together and just learn about uh, uh, atmospheric science and what NOAA does. 
And if you were lucky when you went in there, there would be somebody from NOAA as their avatar would be there and they would kind of walk you through little areas. So it was sort of like this idea of uh, a museum meets a, uh, you know, a, a brand, in this case a government brand, uh, meets sort of the, like the, um, you know, with, with, with the storytelling, there's a guide who would kind of take you through. They'd have, a, they had a little event area. And it was, you know, notice how even though it's, it's a little cartoony looking, it was pretty sophisticated, okay? It's so a second life which was kind of made fun of um, by people over time. It really did, uh, you know, it, it took things from that a 2D into the 3D with, um, uh, you know, 2D virtual reality. Um, Reuters then showed up and they, they bought an island. So you had this idea of digital ownership of land too. And so uh, Reuters spent, you know, probably like $100,000 in an island, I'm guessing, at the time, because there was a, a whole economy. And this was their ad for the Reuters Island. You could go there, talk to real journalists who were there in their computers with their avatars. And as you read through like the way that they're promoting this, it should look familiar, because this is the same kind of thing we're seeing people say about what the metaverse will be like. Um, we've already kind of gone through this. Uh, and a, you know, a lot of brands came into Second Life, and then they, they didn't necessarily leave, but the islands just sort of kind of like the people stopped showing up and nothing more happened. Um, but here in 2011, so we've talked a little bit in uh, different presentations about Nani de la Pena. People sometimes forget that her very first uh, piece of virtual reality storytelling was in Second Life. <clears throat> and it was called Gone Gitmo. She basically created a virtual Guantanamo Bay uh, in Second Life and gave you the experience of being uh, one of the detainees and there was even a little game in there where when you get to the about the middle of it let's kind of zoom in here you then uh, have to answer certain questions about what you would do right so now you're uh, you're in uh, you're in Gitmo and you sort of experience what it's like just as an avatar. Uh, it's all based on real information, right? So this is very similar to virtual reality journalism, but it was before headsets. And then here, there's a little game. So you say, okay, what do you want to do next? Do you call your parents? Do you call your lawyer? Ask what you're in here for. Wrong, <laughs> right? The whole point here was that you have no choices, right? So th this idea of uh, you know immersive media and whether it's you know, journalism and storytelling or it's uh, strategic communications like what Novo was doing, um, it's all bit, like, we, like this has all happened before and it's, it's still happening. So you know, 30 years later now, after Snow Crash, this is from uh, in March in CNET. They had a, a story called The Metaverse is on the way, here's what you need to know. And you look at the promises of it. It'll be, it will be this virtual world that parallels our in real life lives. Digital neighborhoods, parks and clubs will spring up possibly in a Single virtual world is spread across many. Futurists envision the development of a 3D virtual world. You might enter it while wearing a headset or AR glasses. So everything there that you see has happened and actually is still there. Second Life never went away. Does anybody use Second Life? Okay, so uh, it, it's, it's, it's still there. There's still an economy in Second Life. There are still people who use it. Um, but there's just more versions of that that are out there. But this whole idea of doing it in a headset or glasses, that's really what's new. Um, and looking even further here, uh, so, you know, what I, I call it the, the metaverse mashup. Like in 2022, 30 years after uh, Snow Crash, it's like, what, what, what does a metaverse mean? And none of this came from Neil Stevenson, by the way. So it's a combination of the, you know, these XR devices, AR, VR, and MR. Um, uh, some kind of interactivity, uh, which can include games. Um, the, uh, people can join a virtual space uh, in multiple ways. So if you don't have a headset, that's fine. You use your computer, use a browser, you could use your phone. If you have one, you put a VR headset on, you're in the same space as others. And uh, maybe in the future you put on some AR glasses and you kind of see those same people in a space with you, how that's gonna work, I'm not quite sure, but that's kind of the vision. 
And then there's this whole kind of economic side of it where it's decentralized through a blockchain, which is primarily so that you can have, uh, your avatar can have clothes and accessories and things that you buy with crypto. And this part is a little bit, I think, very speculative. Uh, but there are examples of it being done right now. And there's just a lot of hype still. So this was uh, uh, a study that Deloitte and Touche uh, sent out saying this major shift is underway. It could radically recompose internets and economies. I love that they use internets like George W. Bush. Uh, this actually is my favorite part. In the integrated marketplace of the future, streamers, social media, and gamer companies could see their business models further disrupted, and not just by younger generations, but by Web 3.0, dun dun dun, right? Uh, it's, there's a lot of hype here, so getting back to uh, you know, Mark's um, introduction of the Gartner hype cycle, Metaverse is definitely, I think you place it in exactly the right place. It's right up here, and we're gonna see a fall into the trough of disillusionment. But remember, as they said in Battlestar Galactica, all of this has happened before and all of this will happen again. It, it did happen, right? We saw that with Second Life. And then the, the question is, are we gonna go through this again, but what's that platform of productivity? Regardless of how that rolls out, uh, there are many tech industry players putting billions of dollars into this right now. That's the other thing that's different. Money and investment are different. You know, instead of it just being one company, um, here and there, and you know, just doing something aside, it's become like they, they're, uh, in some cases, you know, Facebook, you know, famously renamed itself uh, Meta, uh, Mozilla, you know, thankfully, thank, thank goodness, Mozilla, you never went away. Uh, they have an open source sort of metaverse platform called Mozilla Hubs. Um, they also produce uh, an open source code library called A Aframe, and that really is important because uh, without open source. Uh, everything would basically be walled gardens. Um, so this idea of, of things being like really open is very kind of central to the ethos of it. Uh, Microsoft bought Activision, a gaming company. So a lot of people said that's a metaverse play. Uh, anybody used Altspace? So Altspace is, it, it, it was a startup, Microsoft bought it. They were actually doing a lot of what Facebook is trying to do with its uh, horizons. They were doing it about four years earlier in headsets, okay? So a lot of this, like we, we talk about the future, but it's actually already here. It's just not evenly distributed, um, as uh, I think Amy Webb put it that way. Um, Roblox, so you get kind of to uh, the younger generation. I mean, they, they, are, they are in the metaverse now probably more than anyone. I forgot to put Minecraft up here. So thanks for, uh, Ray, for reminding me of that. Um, and brands are putting tons and tons of money in here. So you got, Jose uh, Cuervo, creating a meta distillery in Decentraland, which we'll get into in a second here. Wendy's um, has a, a virtual Wendy's. Uh, Fashion Week um, is there, right? So it's, it's, it's you know, uh, mainstream, in real life brands putting a lot of money into, in some cases, uh, crypto with the NFTs. Um, NFTs are definitely kind of in this trough right now, but they ha haven't gone away. And, Lots of, lots of money too, so land sale, virtual land sale. Um, it's probably something, I don't know, has anyone here bought virtual land? Okay, I'm not surprised. I once bought virtual land for a company I worked for so we could then create something in Second Life and then we decided to shut it down. I found out, oh, it had increased from like $5 to $800 and I had to have this really weird conversation with the, the chief finance officer <laughs> who basically said, just use that for like beer money for your team because I don't even know how to account for this. <laughs> okay, so, but now it's like, this is now becoming a part of our economy, this whole idea of uh, virtual lands, you know, having uh, value, the, uh, the IRS is very involved, the Securities and Exchange Commission is very involved, crypto, all that stuff. So all these, these different areas kind of come together. And then of course, you know, it's not until, so in 2021, then Mark Zuckerberg says, Okay, our whole company of Facebook is going to be meta now. And, you know, they, they, of course, bought Oculus. They spent $10 billion last year. Shareholders aren't happy about that. Um, and they're, they're, they're actually doing a lot of, I think, you know, really pushing uh, the envelope on a lot of things and sort of raising uh, the tide to lift all boats. 
but it's really not just about them. So if, when you hear, you know, metaverse and meta, um, and you know, the Oculus Quest is still a really great all-in-one virtual reality headset. Um, I think I think even the I should say the people who work for the company formerly known as Facebook, I don't think they really want it to be completely controlled by Facebook, um, and I don't think it will. But uh, you know, part of that is because there are so many different permutations of this. Um, here's, uh, if you've never seen Horizon Worlds, this is how it looks and works within a VR headset. This was actually me in, uh, in Zoom. I'd like to, I was piping from my headset the, the visuals into Zoom so my class could see it um, uh, in, during the pandemic. And yeah, we basically went and we met some people. So here's this random person named Hooked on Kush. <laughs> And uh, we're high-fiving, so using the handsets. That was sort of interesting. It didn't quite work. Uh, you can see people's hands are kind of weird. Um, and you know, just looking at this, based on what you saw before with Second Life, it's not that different visually. In fact, visually, it's a little bit worse. Uh, but what's different is that you can be in there with your full body, and you have that immersive you know, feeling. Um, and what should be also different is that you find people and you meet people, but this was just from a few days ago. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the problem of walking into empty worlds, it's just like going into an empty chat room. You know, just to date myself, I remember when I was first out of college, I was working at the Denver Post and I was trying to convince them to create a website. And what they said was, well, Apple has this new online service called eWorld and we want to do that. And I was like, good luck. And the big problem, eWorld had exactly the same problem. It was this nicely designed service and nobody was there, okay? So <clears throat> none of this means that, you know, this is, I mean, I, uh, Horizons or whatever is, uh, they're gonna continue with that, I'm sure, but, you know, we're, we're in very early days of this phase. Um, but here's another that you may or may not have heard of. It's called Spatial, so if you go to spatial.io. Um, I think of it as your face in the metaverse. So. Uh, if, you, if you look at this video, you'll see that the avatars look a little bit more realistic, and especially their faces. So you can't really see it here, but that's actually my head. You start off by taking your phone and you kind of do this, sort of like what we all now do for Face ID. <laughs> I think with uh, uh, Apple, the latest iOS, they do that for, to scan your ears for a spatial audio. Um, but you know, it's, it's uh, the, the idea of kind of getting more, making people look a little bit more real uh, in the metaverse. Um, is uh, something they focus on, uh, but you don't have legs in the metaverse, and it's really kind of weirding people out, so I think that might be like a next um, frontier. Um, this here is something called Decentraland, uh, and it's all based on blockchain. So if you can imagine something like Second Life, but there's a what's called a, a decentralized, uh, a DAO, De decentralized autonomous organization uh, that uh, votes on a blockchain, um, which I don't even want to get into that, what that means, but it's not exact, it's not completely controlled by one company. The community kind of controls the rules of the space and in a decentralized way. And um, I'm accessing this just from my computer, by the way, and then of course you have to have your weird avatars. I don't know why it's got to be a, like a jacked up, whatever that is, <laughs> bear, bear man pig. Um, but uh, he's actually a bot too, by the ways. Then you go around and you just kind of, it's the same kind of thing, like, okay, there's people that are chatting, it's, there's spatial audio, and uh, it's interesting, yeah, there's an octopus serving drinks, I mean, why not? So, um, it's sort of a wild west, but it kind of always has been, and um, eventually, though, what you realize is that Decentraline is all built around NFTs, and that when you go in there, um, you eventually find digital art, and you can see, oh, how much Ethereum is that, uh, 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 I forget, it's like the gorillas or something, it's like all these different memes, and when you actually look up, oh, you know, how much is, uh, you know, 5,000 Ethereum, it's a lot of money in, in uh, US dollars. So, uh, yeah, and you can kind of control, control your own avatar and everything. So, there's a lot, a lot of different experiments going on, I, you know, and you wonder, like, where should I focus? I mean, what I think is 
you know, don't get too caught up in exact implementations. Because we've seen it's, this idea has been with us for a long time. It was with us even before things like Second Life. So this is a book, I know I've talked about this at this conference and others uh, uh, in the past, but it's a book that my dad, who's uh, a mathematician among other things, and he's, he gave this to me when I was a kid, and it's called Flatland. Go read this book, it was written in 1884. Basically, it goes like this. There's a land that's all flat. There's all these shapes that live on it. They can only see along uh, the uh, two dimensions, right? And so a line just looks like a pattern. It will turn into a point, and then it'll you know, get really wide. A triangle sort of has its pattern. But circles always remain the same, and so they're the high priest of fat, flat land. And then one day, a new shape appears out of nowhere. And it goes, it's like there's nothing there, and it's a point. And then suddenly, it's like a circle. The circles are very threatened by this. They say, who are you, what are you? They put it in jail. Uh, the, uh, the new shape happily agrees to do that. And uh, in jail, there's a square who's the jailer. The square starts interviewing the, uh, the, the shape. It says, well, what are you? He says, oh, I'm a sphere. And I come from the third dimension. And the uh, square says, what's that? He says, let me take you there. He picks him up and suddenly, the two-dimensional square can see the three-dimensional world as he has always has been, but he didn't know it. And I see that as an analogy for media. We have always been in the third dimension. I, forget, I think it was Chris who said this yesterday. Um, we, we like, and, and we live and breathe in the third dimension, in, th in, th in three dimensions, and more than that probably. Uh, but we've been conditioned through media to just be in flatland. Um, so. You know, we, we yearn to just kind of be in places with people like we are here. I think in the pandemic, we all experienced what it was like to be completely alone. And then we found ways to be together alone through, you know, again, flat screens, right? But uh, some of us um, put on headsets if we had them and we went into these metaverse platforms. And I'll tell you when it was like a week three of the total lockdown uh, in the state of New York, I was just like, I need to go see some live music and drink a beer, even if it's virtual beer. And I had my real beer there, and I went to a concert, and it was actually pretty cool, <laughs> uh, you know, because I because I had I experienced the loss of that. So that's the, sort of how I, I see this all kind of fitting together. Oh, sorry, I have a timer here. Okay, good. Um, so this this world, it's it's not that it's coming, it's actually here, and it will just get more immersive, I think. It'll start to show, you're already starting to see 3D. We've seen so many examples this week of, uh, of you know, how 3D is moving into our phones and our devices, and, you know, you can jump inside in a headset, and, you know, maybe the future glasses you put on and you see avatars next to you, maybe they, you know, they look more and more realistic. So what I think we should be focusing on is, like, be getting really good at the building blocks of the metaverse and know how to create content like this so that whatever the platform is, uh, we're able to bring our stories into that space. And thankfully, as you've kind of learned also through this, this weekend, it's become an easier and easier to do that, less expensive, just like every other technology. So 360 content, uh, you know, the 360 cameras are you know, well under $500 now. 3D model capture, I have some examples of how you can do that today. Um, Augmented reality, there's a lot of different experiments out there, um, but I've been focusing on A-frame myself and then um, uh, the idea of social. Um, so we're all kind of familiar with 360. This is something I did with uh, a group of my students um, at a cultural center, and we uh, basically uh, did 360 video of this traditional Puerto Rican dance. This is all done in Adobe Premiere. It was pretty easy. It used to be that this kind of thing took many, 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 many hours just to produce one video, and there was a lot of, uh, a lot of work involved. Uh, 3D capture. Looks like I could hit play here. <clears throat> Over here you see the, uh, the Turnio Plus app is one that I like. Another common one is Polycam. Uh, Clone is another. These apps uh, that um, Clone works on Android, by the way, is the other only work on iOS, if that makes a difference to you. Um, but uh, you can basically just move your phone around something, including around somebody, by the way, and you get a 3D model at the end that has pretty high quality. 
Uh, it used to be the only way to do this was with desktop software. Um, you can get much higher resolution uh, 3D models with uh, things like reality capture, but I feel like this is probably the, the way most people are gonna be capturing, and I actually believe that we're seeing the reinvention of what the idea of a photo is um, through our phones, and that you know, maybe you know, 10 or 20 years from now, we'll look back at our old flat photos and we'll call them something else, like flatties. <laughs> Uh, they'll be like, oh, wait, how do you move around, right? Uh, it'll be like the kindergartner, you know, going to your, uh, um, your screen and trying to swipe. And it's like, mommy, why doesn't it move? Um, that's going to be what our photos look like. Um, augmented reality. So there are a lot of different things you can do with augmented reality, but this is one that I really like. So this is called Google Model Viewer. And uh, if you just go to that link down there, modelviewer.dev, there's an editor there. And you can take a, a 3D model that you got from one of those apps I showed you, and once it's on your computer, you just drag and drop it into the left pane, and then it writes code for you that lets you do things like this, where you can then annotate it. Um, this is actually a little, like, it's called a little free library. It's right down the street from me. Um, and uh, this is actually pretty cool. There was a, a, uh, a poster of a lost cat right there <laughs> that came out through the scan. I was very excited. Um, so it's like, last cat, make sure you don't miss that, right? So, I mean, this is like super simple uh, AR storytelling, but it's, you know, the price is exactly zero dollars and zero cents um, because it uses code. And as long as you do the work to just get the model in the right format, and then you know how to use HTML code, right? All you students here will learn it. I, I, it's gonna do you well. Um, does the body good then you, you, know, you can do stuff like that. But then uh, you know, we don't want to forget the importance of storytelling and all this. So I talked about this more last year. And if you look back at the archives, you can kind of watch this. But this was a, a piece I did with uh, some students. It's actually won a lot of awards since then called Visualizing 81. And we use all these tools I'm talking about to create a story that uh, you, you use in a browser. But what you're seeing here is I'm actually entering it on an Oculus headset. So the Oculus. Uh, headsets have a browser in it, and um, after when we have our time later, that's what I'm going to show everybody is that, oh, you can go to a web page uh, in, uh, in the Oculus, and then you can, it's like all around you. So think of the idea of a web page being stuck in flatland. That's no longer true. All of us can be the sphere. Um, and yeah, you can see your hands and everything. Um, and, and throughout this whole piece, I mean, there's a story. It's a uh, if you go to visualizing81.thenewshouse.com, uh, highly recommend reading it because it's uh, a story that's happened again and again um, around the world is what I'm learning. People were contacting me of highway projects being used to justify uh, bulldozing redlined, mostly people of color communities. Um, I was recently in South Africa in Cape Town. The same thing happened there, but instead of 4,500 people being displaced, it was 60,000, and that's called District 6. Um, and so th those are the important things, you know, to, to think about is once you have the building blocks, um, un uh, you, you know, under your belt, then how do you apply that naturally to stories where it really makes sense? So um, this is not a, a project of mine, but it is a project that uh, Veda Shastri, formerly New York Times, um, produced at the National Geographic. And it's one of my favorite pieces of immersive media. This is actually a video showing somebody using it. So this is just straight off YouTube. And it's uh, called uh, National Geographic Explorer VR. And basically, you start off as a photographer working for National Geographic. And you get an assignment. The assignment is, we want you to go to Machu Picchu. And we want you to take certain pictures. And then once you take the pictures, kind of uh, you know, rank them. And then bring them back to your editor. Um, so. Yeah, so now, I mean, they do some cool stuff with the brand, too, and then you're in Machu Picchu. They 3D scanned the buildings of Machu Picchu, which I was excited about because I've been there, and I'm telling you, it was so close to what it was like to be there. It's like I got, I got to go back. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's like everything is, it, the, the visual acuity is really good, but what, it, what I think is smart about it is it's not just, hey, here's a 3D scan model of Machu Picchu. What do you think, right? It's... They, they, they put you in the story, and they've gamified it, right? So this is an example of gamifying everything. I don't know. Ray, have you tried this? <laughs> you should. It's, it's worth the 9 dollars 
Um, oh, sorry, I just wanted to make sure we had time for our... Uh, Okay, um, so there are other, so, but all of that, as cool as that is, it's not really the metaverse, right? It's, it's, it's still an experience of one. So one of the, the big issues with especially VR in particular is, you know, you're bowling alone in the meta, like in those stories. You, you go in there and you're taken away from wherever you are and there's none, nobody else there uh, most of the time. Um, so what I want to show you here is actually something it's called Nowhere, and I can, I can show this to people uh, later. Uh, if you go to youarenowhere.com, uh, one of my former students actually works for this now. He actually was the same one who worked on Visualizing 81, and it's like Zoom meets Second Life, or Zoom meets uh, Facebook Horizons. And instead of having an avatar, you have these little clam-shaped um, you know, objects, and your, uh, your video, face shows up on that and you use your arrow keys to move around. It's, it, it sounds and looks goofy, right? But I'm telling you, when we had our class in this, so I basically got to tell my Zoom class, it's like, hey everybody, so um, in the next 10 minutes, we're gonna go on a field trip. And they all said, yay, right? Get us out of that, you know, get us out of flat land, out of the Brady Bunch box of Zoom. And uh, what we did here is, uh, Sonny Skiraswolo, who's right there, he's the one who built this, uh, this, this world, uh, using 3D scanning, uh, using 3D modeling software, Blender, to be uh, specific, and we all met, and we ended up uh, meeting inside of a coffee cup. I don't know if you saw that, we all sort of like flew up there, and we're, in this, we're inside of a coffee cup. Um, it's like, you can do that now, right? And I mean, it's, it, it was fun. It's okay to have fun. Uh, in fact, you, with this kind of stuff, if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> um, and nobody really you know, knows the rules, um, and that's okay. So what I also liked about this, by the way, is, is that when we did breakout groups to have discussions, instead of saying, okay, I've assigned you to breakout groups, go off, right, and then they're all gone, I would actually have to go up to everybody and say, okay, you three, follow me over here. And then their little clamshells will follow me and be like, okay, you meet over here by the Nintendo Switch. I want you to talk about this topic. And then, okay, okay you all over there, come over and follow me this way. And so even though it was just using a, you know, a computer and um, you know, a mouse and everything, like I, I have a memory of actually having been there and, and walked around and doing that. So this idea of immersion, like it doesn't necessarily have to have the full depth you get in a VR headset, imagination also plays a role. Um, this is another, I, I call it a metaverse authoring tool. It's really um, right now just a virtual reality authoring tool. It's called Reach. Um, it's produced by uh, Emblematic Group, and in particular, Nani de la Pena, whose name comes up again. Uh, just to be open, I'm now officially an advisor for the startup. This is not a commercial, I'm just showing you what's the next version gonna look like. And pretty soon when you go to reach.love, uh, you can create a free account and then you basically can create uh, uh, little VR stories that consist of those building blocks I talked about. So if you have a 360 photo, you just drag and drop it in. Um, you can go to Sketchfab, which is a, uh, <coughs> a place where, it's like the YouTube of 3D models. Um, and you can find things that people have created or that they 3D scanned and select it. Um, right here I found uh, somebody's, uh, uh, some uh, grass and that they had scanned and then eventually, let's see here, there, there's my 360 uh, photo. I'll kind of zoom ahead here, it's pretty cool. I then, um, I pulled in There we go, a 3D model that I had scanned in um, the Amakala Game Reserve in South Africa, and it was a, a memorial to some white rhinos that were po poached back in 2010 and 2011. Um, I put that in there, and then I went and I found some rhinos that someone had created with 3D software, and I put them in there, and it's just like a little virtual reality memorial. And once it's finished, I just hit a button, and I publish it and I can then send a link to somebody and then you can move around just like we did in Nowhere. And if you open it on a phone, then it looks like this. So it just loads up, you hit the start button 
and you're in the space, when you hold your thumb down, you kind of move around. So it's, it's really simple, but it's still immersion, right? And so the idea is like, okay, you, you, can, you can create experiences based on real stuff, based on imaginary stuff, quickly send them to people, and then they can experience them on their phone. If they have a VR headset, they could hit the VR uh, or send this into their Oculus, and then they, they, you're actually fully in it, so we'll demonstrate that later. So I think these kinds of um, you know, uh, metaverse authoring tools that are made for the web, I think we're gonna be seeing more of those. So that's just, just one of many. Uh, Mozilla Hubs also has something called Spoke, and if anybody wants to know more about that, I can show you. And, it, and you can uh, build these scenes all in a web browser. Back in the day, back when uh, uh, I was working with Ray and we were trying to create <laughs> this farm from uh, Clorinda, Iowa uh, in Unity, it, it was nothing like this, right? I mean, there was a lot of 3D modeling, but even once you did that, you had to like, we had to spend hours just debugging this thing in this you know, monstrous application. Now you can do it on a web browser and I think that's just amazing. So um, just to kind of sum things up, these are just some of the questions that come to my mind. Uh, you know, no, seeing where things are heading. Uh, you know, how does a story change when it's explored with other people, right? So, you know, we saw the uh, honey, I shrunk the kids you know, crazy environment, well, what if it was like a more of a realistic place that you recreated um, and you're learning about January 6th and you're there with people in the, the capital, right? And people are exploring that together and as you move through, you know, certain information kind of reveals itself as you move through the space. Maybe there are certain things that you have to do in conjunction with other people to unlock other information. You know, when, when you hear that, I think traditional journalists would hear that and say, well, that, that's not serious news and that sounds like a game. Yeah, it is a game and guess what? There's, uh, thanks to uh, working as an educator now for 10 years, I could tell you, when you interact with things, with information, you understand it better and you remember it better. And there's like study after study after study that shows that. When you add immersion into that and social interaction, it really solidifies things. So I feel like this whole idea of Exploring information together in fun and stimulating ways, I, I, that is a, its own medium. Um, you know, what kind of understanding can result only through group experience? I sort of apply that to any emerging technology, right? Just because, just because you can make a 360 video, should you? Well, only if it's the only way you can understand that information better or, you know, feel it better. Um, otherwise, it's a gimmick. Um, and then who are the right partners? So, you know, I've, uh, and actually it was interesting to hear, you know, what Ray was talking about with the uh, uh, African American History Museum working with them. Um, I found myself, just with student projects, uh, just naturally we end up working with these kinds of organizations, museums, art galleries. Um, you know, I think movie theaters are on the horizon. I'm gonna sh show you uh, what I mean by that in a second here. Um, community art centers, you know, schools, like, Places where people meet and they have a mission, um, they, you know, think of places or, or organizations, they already um, kind of serve their mission through uh, physical space. I think there are opportunities to work with them and bring journalism into those spaces and bring those spaces into journalism um, through, through the metaverse. And, uh, this is another uh, kind of everything old is new again. There's a company that uh, <clears throat> disappeared during the pandemic and I was very sad to hear it because I actually tried this out. Has anybody heard of this or tried it? It's called The Void. Um, it's coming back, okay? Somebody bought The Void after it went out of business, um, brought it back and then rehired the original uh, person who, who started it. And basically it's currently being used for things like inter uh, movies uh, but this here is sort of their ad. And the way it works is you essentially go into something like a laser tag arena with your friends. Uh, but they install these in, this one was installed in the Madame Tussauds Wax Museum in New York City. And I tried it back in 2016. And uh, you kind of put, put on, um, you know, a, 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 like a VR helmet, but you also are given the Ghostbusters gun in this case. <laughs> and you walk through a hotel and you're getting those green ghosts and you have to make sure that you can work together 
to then, um, yeah, you're like, I think this is gonna come back, so, so be on the lookout for it. Um, they also did something with Star Wars and Disney, and you know, it's entertainment. We're here at a journalism conference, right? Although it is mobile media, and uh, entertainment is media also. Um, but think about how, for any kind of story, right? When I said, how could you explore things together? Well, that can happen in physical space. So uh, also before the pandemic, uh, the last big conference I went to was called VRX, or I think it's now Reuters uh, XR Intelligence. And there was a session there where there were about three different people from three different companies that were working on platforms like this. They were already making deals with AMC and uh, Regal Cinemas to take some of those old, uh, unused, uh, frankly disappointing uh, small cinemas. You know when you get that ticket and you think you got like the really big one, you're like, oh no, we're in this one? Well, they're gonna be raising those, uh, um, uh, setting them up so they're flat and creating things like The Void, okay? And then you'll pay a little bit more to then have the experience of the movie with your friend, right? All of this is starting to come together, so, you know, just to kind of sum it up with, you know, the, the metaverse, it takes all different, uh, it's all different kind of shapes and sizes, right? It's, um, it could be in person with people, it could be, you know, uh, some people are there physically, some are, you know, somewhere else, and there's some way that they're kind of represented. Um, it could be, you know, all in virtual, where everybody is, you know, uh, kind of not in the same location. Um, all of that really comprises this idea of the metaverse. But actually, this is the real important thing to think of, is lots of looming questions on the ethics side, right? But we can't even begin to discuss these kinds of questions unless we understand the spaces. So I just want to encourage everybody, go out there and try some of these, uh, these metaverse platforms that you saw. Um, you don't need to have a VR headset to do it. You can do it all on your computer. And just, even if you hate it, just go and like see what it's like, right? And then start thinking about the opportunities, but also what are some of the issues, right? So, um, you know, what's, what's ethical to 3D capture? One thing that I learned recently from one of my media uh, law professor friends is that, well, if something was, if you're scanning statues, you probably don't want to scan something that was created after 1951. Um, and then next year it'll be after 1952. And that has to do with public domain flaws. And if you do, you could be sued by the artist, all right? Because they, unless they give you the rights for that. So we have all these statues out in the campus here. I guess they're older than 1951, but you know, you want to check, <laughs> all right? You, you could get sued. Um, if you allow yourself to be scanned like this, it's called a T-pose. And with a T-pose, someone else can animate you. They could put you in their metaverse story, doing whatever they want to have you do, okay? Um, and they don't, and, and they should ask you, and you could sue them if you found out, but who wants to go through that, right? Be careful with your personal 3D body data. Um, your face as well. Um, so, you know, platforms, are already out, like I showed you, you know, spa uh, spatial, where you kind of scan your face. What happens if somebody buys that company and they have all the spatial data, right? When that happens with bodies, watch out. Um, how do we uh, protect social space in VR? Facebook has already, in the Facebook Horizons uh, app, has already had to implement a boundary so that people can't, it's almost like you have like a, a virtual hula hoop around you and you can't get too close. Well, why is that? Because there were mostly male avatars groping mostly female avatars, <laughs> and that's essentially uh, sexual assault in the metaverse, okay? So, <clears throat> uh, deep fakes, I didn't coin this phrase, but um, I wish I could remember who did, it was a professor at Yale. He said, you know, what happens when a, a deep fake becomes a deep experience? And I think, um, one of our other speakers kind of alluded to that too, or maybe a few of us did. Um, with the AI that we've been talking about as well, there are versions of GPT-3 that can basically uh, take, whether it's a 2D image or a 3D space, and they can kind of fill in the gaps and create experiences that seem very realistic, okay? When you can also put people in there and their actions feel, look and feel real, Entire scenes could be created. 
and they might actually be difficult for the common person to tell the difference between reality and fiction. Um, so that's something, we can't stop that from happening, but as journalists, we better understand what's possible so we can then warn everybody and tell them, hey, right? And start figuring, and talking to experts and find out how do you really identify if something was a, was a deep, deep faked experience? Because that's coming as well. And yeah, choose your own Black Mirror adventure. So I don't mean to kind of end on a complete down note. <laughs> um, there's more information on how to reach me. So I think we have some time for questions. Or do we not? Yeah, we got about 10, 10 minutes or so. Yeah. Or ideas, we can have discussion. So it's not every piece of tech or ideas in tech that get like 30 plus years to reach maturity, like metaverse and that concept has had for a while. Um, I mean, there are players like Meta, which is like the Chicago Cubs of the metaverse, where they have seemingly unlimited they resources. <laughs> and Well, yeah, um, so many resources and they still can't quite figure it out. And so what, for I guess two part question. One, what do you think Meta is missing or doing wrong as such a large player in the space to still not have it quite figured out? And the second part of the question is just, what is it going to take? Is there is there some type of catalyst that will help the metaverse have the maturity and adoption that like the mobile phone has or social media platforms have for yeah. connectivity? I mean, for the first question, I think there's a lot of things <laughs> that they're, they're, they're doing wrong. Um, the one that concerns me most is directly related to what happened with Facebook. All the tracking that's going on, or that has gone on with Facebook, which we all became much more aware of after the Cambridge Analytica scandal, right? And everything that happened after that. Um, I think one of the motivating factors for uh, Zuckerberg in particular, buying Oculus and wanting to then kind of own that whole space is because A, he doesn't have to go through, or they don't have to go through a third party like Apple or Android, and they own the platform. And they can then track things that they weren't able to track before, right? Things that they're actually being blocked from tracking um, on phones already, right? Uh, with the, you know, Apple's do not track, and then what kind of Google's coming along with. But the tracking is not just Oh, what did you click on? What did you look? You know, what did you uh, bring up? It's um, how did you move? What is your unique uh, body movement signature? Right. So think about that. You know, uh, the cookie in the future with the metaverse could actually be your unique gait, your mannerisms, how you move. The AI can actually tell that, and that's actually not even something new that that uh, Facebook invented. Microsoft's been doing that for a while with the Connect. It's all in there in the API, if you look, if anybody ever played with Connect. Uh, so data privacy, really concerned about that. Um, almost to the, the extent that I don't really like to go into their platform, because um, I, just, I just don't really trust them based on past history and also just because they say, oh, yeah, we learned our lesson, now we're gonna like, protect privacy. I just also don't trust based on that. We have to kind of see, the, the proof's gonna be in the pudding. And the second question again was, um, Yeah, so I think really um, easy, um, pain-free uh, authoring solutions, just like we saw, have seen with TikTok. I mean, you know, who is it who said that, you know, TikTok is only possible because of 5G or 4G even, or LTE? Um, you know, that's also true for things like this because of the file, but even more so, the file sizes are huge. So like the tools like I was showing with Reach, but there are others that I th think we'll be seeing as well, where you can just kind of you know, pull things together and it not just creates a nice scene for you, but then it optimizes everything automatically. Because these 3D models, if you start getting into this, are huge, even the ones from your phone. And optimizing is a huge pain. It reminds me of stitching videos back in the day using AutoPano Pro. The, the piece of software anybody who worked with 360 in the early days never wants to remember. Um, and, uh, and then I, I, I really think like once you create your environment, your world, then making, that, making it uh, possible for that to be 
used in any metaverse platform. So that's inter interoperable, I think is really important. So pretty much all the big companies that are working on the metaverse, they say that that's what they're gonna do, they're gonna be interoperable, but you know, based on what those companies have done in the past, they're gonna have a lot of barriers. <laughs> they're not gonna make it super easy. Maybe it'll be interoperable for a fee, you know, things like that. So I think, um, you know, it's kind of uh, incumbent on all of us and, you know, consumers to say, we want that or we're not gonna use your products, right? We, like, because if it's gonna re, if it's, something is gonna recreate reality to a greater extent than social media already has, so you think about it, we already live in social media, right? It's, it, it, when, it, when you lose it, which I did once for two months, you see it. You actually are depressed for like three days. And then you find out you're way happier, which I found interesting. <laughs> uh, but then I went right, right back in, um, and uh, you know, after getting my social media accounts back, uh, but with, when something is like so real, and it's, you know, and it uses your whole body, right, that body experience, and that's tied into your social experience, I think that it becomes a different thing, right? We, we can't have it be, that be something that is controlled by even the companies we saw up on the list there, like, we, like, you need to control it, right? And your ability to interact with others. Um, and I worry about that, too, by the way, so I'm not... I'm not sitting up here saying the metaverse is going to be great, right? It could actually be the dystopian future that uh, that Neil Stevenson saw. Um, but we have a role in that. I think in media uh, and in journalism, like we have a bigger role than most people have, so we have a bigger responsibility to help make sure that kind of thing doesn't happen. So. Thank you, Dan, for making the metaverse so much more inviting to me. That was awesome, <laughs> except for the nod to Black Mirror, which is super scary. Um, <laughs> Uh, do you feel like the metaverse is a winner-takes-all space from a platform perspective, or do you see as that technology matures that there's still going to be all these players with different headsets, different worlds, different virtual environments, like the economics of that? Yeah, I mean, it, it remains to be seen, really, right? So I guess the way I'd answer that is look at, look at the internet itself, and how it was designed and how it was designed to be open and have interoperability built in and free, right? And look at where we are because of our desire for convenience and um, the latest gadgets and you know everything. Like we actually stepped into walled garden worlds as a society, you know, global society you know, we, we gave up that freedom. Underneath, it's all still this open system. So uh, the, the, the metaverse, with the exception of the way blockchain works, it's all built on the same foundation of the internet. Then you have blockchain in there, and it gets a little more interesting, um, especially with the economics. If you want to buy land into central land, it'll cost you like $15,000 today for one little, like, plot, okay? So there's already like this big barrier there. Um, and I think that that's probably the, gonna be the bigger, um, I think that the economics of that, like the, the price to entry is gonna probably uh, determine how you know, open or closed things are than these big companies, right? But then those big companies will kind of add their own layer, so. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, I mean, the one reason I keep, and I look at our young people here, I say, it's like, you know, learn your HTML, right? The internet is, it, it's still a, you know, a free and open system. And as long as that's the case, there's no reason that, you, that there can't be um, you know, metaverse-like platforms. There already are that are just completely uh, you know, open. They just don't have the social aspect, right? That's the key. So you can create these environments, but to make it social, you kind of need this other layer. So. Hey again, Dan. I feel like hey. we're, we're always talking, and uh, you know there, there were a few things in your presentation that really stuck out to me, and I had to write it down here. Uh, the Deloitte report stated gaming companies could see their business models uh, further disrupted, and I cannot agree with that at all. Um, okay. The reason, but Good. no, no, no. But, but the reason why yeah. is I want to hear why. Um, you know, I, I feel as if the gaming industry has adopted a wait and see approach, and the gamers currently are also really pushing back on the concept of the NFTs in the metaverse. So with that being said, I'm curious to get your thoughts on 
how media can currently prepare themselves for what might be coming with the expectations that gamers have now and where things could potentially be considering the ethics and storytelling. I'm thinking back to um, a recent uh, partnership that Time Magazine had done with Fortnite in which they did the March for Speech uh, experience in which uh, within Fortnite they recreated the DC National Mall. Uh, they had Martin Luther King giving his famous uh, I Have a Dream speech, but all of the characters running around were twerking and doing pretty not great things during this, this moment. So what could media do now to better uh, set those expectations and kind of the ethics around them ahead of mass adoption of the metaphors? Good question, and by the way, it's just because I put Deloitte's quote up there doesn't mean I agree with it. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of hype out there and a lot of like the, like the warnings and everything, including myself, even my ethical warnings are, right, are kind of up, up for grabs there. I mean, you know, I, so I was involved pretty early on in um, the, like the, the early explorations of uh, what we then called online community. Um, so starting at the Washington Post, actually, um, uh, we created a, a like a website called Talk Central, and then we had a, like our own message boards. We had to pay someone to code for us, and then I think we used the well. Do you remember? It's like a, yeah, and um, and so what was great then is that we we created the spaces, and then we owned them, and then we were able to then go in and manage them and police them. I, police is the wrong term. We were able to go in and just just manage them, you know, and, and moderate, and so. I think that you know we look at you know metaverse platforms. You know one of the, the the key differences between that and a VR experience is there's other people there. Well, if every all the interactions happening on someone else's platform, they're the ones who get to decide that. And I I still wonder like why did we as news organizations and journalists just cede everything over to Facebook and Twitter and you know now well Meta but really any of these platforms, right? Like you're just sort of, it's almost like, we, like you know, if we, if we want control over, you know, that kind of thing, like we have to beg, right? And say, hey, could we please have this, you know, this ability to kind of, you know, moderate this? Um, I mean, imagine if this, in this conference right here, it was, there were no walls and we were just right, right out in the middle of anywhere and there was a bar right over here and then there's like <laughs> a strip club over there and then there's, a kindergarten over here, okay? That's sort of the environment that something like Twitter is, right? And if that becomes what we all, like our only choice, the choice that, that we all make to only go somewhere like that is this, like this complete free for all, we're gonna have that in the metaverse for sure. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't, I mean, you know, one thing I, that I, I like about uh, things like the Reach platform and also like the You Are Nowhere, you create your own environment and you have total control over it, like they really, um, kind of push that that idea. That's part of their ethos. So I think it's okay to use platforms from others, but make sure that they, that they give you the, you know, it's like like demand the control over over the interaction. Because if not, the best you're going to get is that you know hula hoop force field that that Meta implemented, which doesn't really solve the core problem. Somebody can still go up to you and verbally harass you, right? And then nobody's going to stop them. You know, you can report it, but <laughs> are they going to hear it or not? Uh, I don't know. So. All right. Uh, oh, one more. Oh, yeah, you always have to ask questions. You're like yeah. the best question answer of this whole conference because um, you're always there. So we, we had, we've been talking throughout this weekend about how emerging media can be used in education um, and all that. And there's been talks about um, using, like, VR to show the future generations. We're not quite there yet, but the... <coughs> species that will most likely go extinct in the next five to 10 years. Um, so, but I kind of feel like there's some ethical dilemmas there. Like if we use technology to, you know, scan them, then you're getting close to them. That's humans interacting. So like, where do you see, like, obviously that's a good thing. We should be able to document those creatures, but where do you see like that line being drawn in the sand? Like, where is it going to do more harm than good? Um, first, I have to ask, are you 3D scanning animals? Because that's awesome if you are. I mean, I think it's possible. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's, it would be kind of hard as they move, but um, interesting question. I mean, the, so, I mean, the, the, there need to be some lines for this, right? 
um, and there aren't right now. Anybody who's, who's kind of playing around with photogrammetry, uh, I feel like they're not necessarily asking those questions. They, they, they only seem to come up when there's somebody with a lot of money or a lot of clout who you think could sue you, so then the corporate lawyers have to get involved. <laughs> Like, I don't know, did you have Andrew Yang uh, sign a, a waiver when you scanned him? Because you did, or your, your team did. I'm not looking at Ray here. Yeah, yeah right? So like, like with celebrities and you know, sports and all the, all the usual sus suspects, and there's that kind of implicit conversation. But when it comes to, um, well, I'll, I'll give you a, a great example here. This is, this is a situation I, I fell into, and I didn't realize it. I didn't show this, but the La Casita Cultural Center with the, uh, the 360 video of the Puerto Rican dancers, um, we also 3D scanned that whole space. And we did it with the permission and, and involvement of uh, the person, uh, Teresita Paniagua, who runs the, uh, the space. But then once I got the models and we put them into, we used Google Model Viewer, I think, and then put them online with A-frame so you could then move through the space, it then hit me that, oh, if we use that, then the entire 3D model if someone viewed the source code, they could download it. And then they could do anything they want with that. And so I had to, I called uh, Tara and said, I know this is gonna sound really weird, but somebody could actually download this and they could then put it into a game and it would be like a, like a shooter game and you couldn't control it. Are you okay with that? <laughs> right, and it's like, it was like, like I had to educate her about what was possible, and she basically, she, she's like, oh. And I said, I'm not saying it, that that's gonna happen, but it is possible, it's gonna be on the internet, and you know, this is like a cultural center, you know, um, and so we had to think through that. We had the conversation. In the end, she decided, it's, it's okay, let's just put it out there, but uh, we're gonna make sure that there's, that we register a copyright in there, so then we could try to stop somebody, was basically where she, and she also said, you know, anybody could also come into our space now on their own with one of these apps you use and they could scan the space, so how can I really stop that, <laughs> right? But without the understanding and the conversation, you can't even get to that next, um, you know, you, you, you can't really draw lines, right? Because people don't know that this is possible and that it can happen. Um, that said, I think it'd be really awesome to 3D scan, I don't know, certain penguins that are gonna go extinct and maybe work with somebody who, you know, has uh, some agency over the penguins. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dan. All right, this thanks.